In this short video, we're going to look at some more geometric connections to linear transformations. In particular, we're going to look at rotations, projections, and reflections. Our main focus is going to be in R2, uh, though we will look at a little bit of R3. So to understand rotations, it's very helpful to uh, recall polar coordinates or polar representation. So whenever you have a vector, let's just say a point, right? So you have a point in space. It has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. You can draw a right triangle. The length of the hypotenuse we're going to call r. The angle made with the positive x-axis we're going to call alpha. And from triangle trig, the length of the opposite side will be r sine alpha, and the length of the adjacent side will be r cosine alpha. And so we can have something very similar with vectors. We can have a vector, a position vector, so its tail is at the origin. The length of the vector is going to be r, and the angle made with the positive uh, x-axis is still going to be called alpha. And so the components of that vector can be written as r times cosine alpha, because remember, that is the adjacent side. And then the length of the opposite side tells us how far up we're going. So that would be our second component, r sine alpha. We will restrict the angle uh, to be positive and less than 2 pi. So what we're going to do is define a transformation. It's going to be a rotation through theta, uh, the angle theta. It could be degrees or radians. I write radians because I'm used to using radians. But at any rate, the name of the transformation is ROT sub theta. So normally we have seen uppercase T to represent a transformation. Well, here we are using four characters, the ROT and then the subscript theta. So it's just the name of this transformation, and the effect is to rotate a vector through an angle of theta. So we're going to start with some vector v. It's going to make an angle of alpha with the positive x-axis. We can represent its components in polar form as r cosine alpha, r sine alpha, and remember r is the length of v. And now we're going to rotate that through an additional angle of theta. So this small angle down here is alpha. We're going to have an additional angle of theta. So the final angle for the rotated vector is theta plus alpha. And that's why the components of the rotated vector uh, are cosine theta plus alpha, sine theta plus alpha. I didn't put the r here because uh, I'm just making an assumption that we have a unit vector here. But we'll put the r back in with the analysis here. So now I've got a sum of angles. And so I can use the angle sum formulas for sine and cosine. So here are the components of our rotated vector. Let's go ahead and use those angle sum formulas. And let me write this uh, as a column vector. And why is that? Well, uh, one of the things that we're trying, we want to have, if we know we have a linear transformation, uh, then uh, we want to find the standard matrix for that linear transformation. So let's see if we can do it just from this uh, formula here. Now, when I write this as a column vector, I see that each 
component has two terms. The first term has a common factor uh, of r cosine alpha, and the second terms have a common factor of r sine alpha. So let's write this as the sum of two vectors and factor out the common factor. Now what do I have here? I have a linear combination of two columns. And again, we will see this over and over again. This is why we consider matrix vector multiplication as a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. Or vice versa, anytime we see a linear combination of columns, we can rewrite that as a matrix vector multiplication. And now let's remember that R cosine alpha and R sine alpha, those were the original components, the X and Y components of the vector V. So in order to rotate V, we just have to be multiply the components of the vector V by this matrix, which says that our standard matrix for the rotation transformation through an angle of theta is the 2 by 2 matrix cosine theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. Now, we had to do a lot of work. We had to remember the angle sum formulas, but really, we didn't need to do that. There's another way, and actually it's the more standard way. Uh, for any operator, in any space, but certainly on R2, um, the standard matrix of that operator can be determined by finding the image of the I vector and the image of the J vector under T. That is, the columns are the images of the standard basis vector. So, why don't we calculate? Let's rotate the vector i through theta and the uh, vector j through an angle theta and find out what the components are of the rotated vectors. So we're going to start with the vector i. Remember, it's a unit vector. It is running parallel to the positive x-axis. Let's rotate it through an angle of theta going through an angle of theta, and we've got a right triangle. I is a unit vector, so the hypotenuse is 1, and so that would mean the length of the opposite side is sine theta, and the length of the adjacent side is cosine theta. So the components of the rotated vector, the x component is cosine theta, and the y component is sine theta. So that tells me that rho theta of i is cosine theta, sine theta. That is going to be the first column of the standard matrix of rho theta. Now with j, we have to be a little bit more careful here. Uh, when we find the components, when I rotate j through a positive angle of theta, uh, remember theta has to be positive, then um, to get the components, I have to think about this right triangle. And remember that the length of the opposite side is sine theta. But I see that the vector is pointing in the negative x direction. And so that's why it, the component of the vector is minus sine theta. Now, the adjacent side of this triangle is cosine theta. That would be the vertical component, so that's what, or the y component. That's why we have cosine theta there. And that gives us our second column. It's going to be minus sine theta and cosine theta. And so either way, we get the same standard matrix for rote theta. So let's just do a little example. We'd like to find the standard matrix of a rotation through an angle of pi over 6, pi over 6 radians here. So we just need to know sine of pi over 6 and cosine of pi over 6, and then substitute them in our formula. 
So let's look at projections and reflections. The idea of a projection is you imagine that you go to the top of the vector and then you go straight down. Straight down means perpendicular to the reflection line. I'm sorry, to the projection line, to what you're being projected onto. And then where you stop, that is going to be the head of the projection vector. So essentially what you're doing is you're throwing away anything that any component of V which is not in the direction of the x-axis. And so we see that, right? And the, the projection is on the x-axis, so the, the y component is going to be 0. Now the x component is the same as the x component of the original vector. And so what does that say? If I take a vector x, y, its projection on the x-axis, the x component stays the same, and the y component is set to 0. So that means the if I think about the i vector, the i vector is not changed by projecting. It's already on the x-axis, and so i stays i. But if I take the j vector, if I were to take the j vector, hmm. oops, I gotta do it one more color. There we go. I take the j vector and project it onto the x axis. Well, it's gonna go straight down to the origin. Right, so it's going to go to the zero vector. So that's why we have zero, zero in the second column. And it's very similar with the uh, projection of V onto the Y axis. Now we just set the X component to zero, keep the same Y component. The image of the I vector now would be the zero vector. But the j vector is not changed by projecting it onto the y-axis because it's already on the y-axis. Reflections might even be easier to understand. Uh, very simple geometric operation. And if I reflect in the x-axis, the x component does not change, but the y component changes sign. And so that's why we have, uh, for something that's on the x-axis, the i vector doesn't change at all, but the j vector is going to point in the opposite direction. And we see something uh, very similar when we reflect in the y-axis. It is the y-coordinate that stays the same, and the or the y component and the x component changes sign. There is a nice connection between reflections and projections. This can generalize beyond R2, but let's just look at it in R2. If I look at the reflection in the x-axis, here I have the projection of v onto the y-axis. I can make a couple of copies, and in fact, it's exactly two copies that connects the head of the reflection to the head of the original vector v and then just a little uh, geometric interpretation of vector addition says that the reflection of v in the x-axis is the same as taking v and then subtracting off i'm subtracting because i'm going in the opposite direction of these blue vectors subtracting off twice the projection of V on the y-axis. We have a similar relation uh, with the reflection in the y-axis. The reflection in the y-axis is the same as taking V and then subtracting twice the projection on the x-axis. Now we're not going to spend too much time uh, thinking about projections and reflections in R3, 
but there's a very simple pattern. Um, so if you're going to project onto one of the coordinate axes, like you're going to project onto the x-axis, well, remember, in that case, uh, you're, the only component that stays the same is the component corresponding to that coordinate axis. So the x component will stay the same. Everything else goes to 0. And so you'll have a 1. So the projection matrix is going to be a diagonal matrix where you only have a 1 corresponding to the column for the coordinate axis. So if I project onto the x, the 1 will be in the uh, first diagonal entry. If I project onto y, it's in the second diagonal entry, and so on. Um, when you project onto a plane, uh, so if I project onto y, the yz plane, so it's the y, both y and z are not going to change. It's x that's going to go to 0. And that's true for the other coordinate planes and for the z-axis. Reflections follow pattern 2. So I'm going to reflect in the x-axis. Well, remember in R2, when you reflect in the x-axis, the x component doesn't change. The y component changes sign. In R3, the x component doesn't change, but both the y and the z change sign. If I reflect in one of the coordinate planes, so if I reflect in the yz coordinate plane, then the yz components are not going to change. So y and z will not change. It's only the x that will change sign. And that's true uh, for all of the reflections in the uh, coordinate axes and the coordinate planes in R3. So I hope you find that these uh, geometric interpretations are useful. It's something that we will be able to refer back to, especially the ones in R2. We will be looking at R2 and using them as examples and their corresponding uh, standard matrices to help us understand certain properties of transformations and matrices.